sell to, would sell to you footage that you can come up with your own content, uh, not content, a commentary, you could write your own text, you could borrow pictures, and you don't even have to pay for it. Uh, we knocked on doors of every single European institution and the press agencies, whatever it is that they are doing. And we went to Canberra because they have an embassy in Canberra, uh, which means they are behaving like a state, right? But what's important, none of the things that they implemented is accessible in Australia. If you look at the map, it would be that they are targeting neighboring countries. Um, Russia is the furthest, and Northern Africa is the one to the south. So no wonder that Australians don't have access to it. They don't know it, it doesn't reach them. So it's kind of not their fault. Yes, it does reach China. Chinese have, have for example, 25 different journalists accredited in Brussels. Australia has no, we were asked every EU institution, they went and checked, they have no two minutes or two Australian journalists. <laughs> <laughs> so they told us uh, they checked and there was not a single person from Australia, yet there were plenty from China, for example. So it does take mutual interest, right? You have to be interested, you have to send someone there. So the result, we have the staff of the legend, we have the person who promoted, we have the media who promoted, who is visible, what is visible we know, the, the, the message is not visible, the, the crisis is visible, faces that Europe has uh, created to promote Europe, are they visible? No, from Australia it seems that Angela Merkel is running Europe, she is the leader, <laughs> unofficial leader, <laughs> most often mentioned person in newspapers, and uh, Trichet, who was at the time of the research last year, the first half of the year, uh, the president of the European Central Bank, and then its national leaders like Sarkozy and Merkel, followed by <coughs> If you compare it with China, Merkel again taking the lead, but also European leaders much more visible. But it happened when we had our discussions at the, at the table that um, European leaders actually make it to China every now and then. So they become themselves known. They only came to Australia in the second part of last year, which we didn't cover. We stopped our research there, so we don't know how it this compares to when somebody comes, talks to the local media, talks to the local people, has a picture with the kangaroo or something. We don't know that, so maybe we could follow this up. Uh, today we had a person pulling out from our from our panel, so I quickly went to check what it is that he had had to say to us because we talked to. Mark Baker before. That was Mark Baker, by the way, from the yes, edge, so, unfortunately. And I had more hope, in, hope thinking, what if nobody comes? So, <laughs> <laughs> so he told us about the sources. The sources that he uses at his newspapers, at the time when I spoke to him last year, he was in charge of three newspapers, Sydney Morning Herald, The Canberra Times, and The Age. We didn't cover the content, we just talked to him. He said that they rely on British sources, for example, The Guardian and The Daily Tele Telegraph, if they have a correspondent, that person is based in London. And really, we did find uh, lots of articles simply reprinted from The Guardian or from any other British newspaper with no relevance to Australia at all. Uh, you might wonder, the British are the <coughs> skeptics, they don't like the project, they like their own empire that they used to have and they <laughs> don't have to want to listen to the decisions made in Brussels. So they criticize every single bit of the, of the European project. If such, a news, if such an article gets reprinted, what does it mean? What does it really say? I, I wasn't really um, aware of what it was trying to say. And we have other people from other media saying, I think there's a sense that the Europeans are more or less incapable of organizing themselves. This is not more or less what you said already, right? We are scratching our heads, wondering how to explain everything in a 600 word uh, newspaper. For example, Greece is of particular interest to us because in Melbourne we have the third biggest Greek city in the world. We have extremely high Greek population, but we also look at it and we think, how the hell did we get into such a mess? So we, the journalists simply don't know how to explain it. Another one, it's hard to keep explaining what they, why they're having all those meetings and nothing comes out of this. It's really frustrating. That's a broadcasting journalist. Um, is it difficult or easy to sell Europe to Australia? At the moment it's easy because everyone, everything I write they take. So what is of interest to me, they, they, it gets run. That's a person from your newspaper, from the Financial Review. Another one, we certainly give European stories a good one when the news value warrants it. And certainly, this current financial crisis definitely warrants it. That was a person who didn't want to say his name. 
uh, I mean, reveal his name. And another one, if the system is about to collapse, it's not difficult to sell at all. It sells itself, right? That was another your colleague, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, people in Europe, we told them what's the story like here in Australia, they say, yes, we know it. So, in terms of public perceptions, there is a story about decline out there, everywhere, outside of Europe. Europe is seen as an open-air museum, it's going down the drain. But let's not forget that the EU is still the wealthiest region in the world, and the first to be reckoned with. So, he's still alluding to the message that they, message that they actually have, that they are not just about the crisis. So let's face it, Greece is not even 3% of the problems that we have. I mean, it's not a problem, a real problem here in Europe, right? So we have a debt problem here because of, okay, it's his words, <laughs> because of reckless spending of some governments, but this is not an EU problem. So the previous panel talked about perceptions and reality. For the EU people, it's definitely, there is a difference between perceptions and reality. I'm not sure whether they, if they were a candidate in the American elections, what would they be saying? <laughs> because in America it seems the other way around. It's perceptions is a reality. So that's a spokesperson for the European Union. And I just remember that a couple of days ago they got a Nobel Prize for exactly the brand that they are trying to sell, right? For democracy, for contributing to peace and reconciliation, and for, yeah, I'll, 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 <laughs> democracy and human rights. So if, if there are voices um, saying, could we take Greece out of this and fix the mess? We could not, because then we would not be able to say we are promoting democracy. This is where it was born, and we took it from them. We can't sell it without them, right? So it's not the solution. The overall picture, Brand Europe, as in the, in, the, in the shape that Europe would like it to be seen, it's nowhere to be seen in Europe. Europe is about crisis, is that, as, as the person from Europe said, it's a story of decline. It's still about member states, not the unity and integration projects. Europe is fading away in perceptions. Uh, we spoke to, as Patrick mentioned, not only to media people, but also to pol political elites, to civil society, and who else? Business people. And more or less everybody thinks Europe is losing no interest in Europe anymore, Asia is gaining importance, right? So, and this is what I was trying to find out for you for yes. the discussion, right? Yes, that's what fantastic. It is that makes it. Well, we will, we will discuss that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to Patrick, too. That discussion, which is a really interesting one, actually. But before I hand over to Christopher, can I just say that it's anyone who knows anything about news values and how you know stories are pitched, as long as the crisis is running, because it is still running, uh, the way it is, it's going to be very hard to sell brand Europe. But hopefully, there'll be you know other times after the crisis. So, Christopher, over to you then. You are in the situation where you are publishing a, a, a bilingual um, Greek and English publication. So what's your take on all this? Um, yeah. Well, I actually prepared a for about uh, Yeah, that's uh, fine. Running, yeah. Running, yeah. Uh, yeah. You do whatever you want to do. Which I will go through, but I, mean, yeah. I think what I'll go through is it's a bit easier for me. Uh, but I think uh, my perspective, I mean, I publish a Greek and English newspaper. It's a, it's, so it's a, just about everything that's such a lot here is somehow reflected in what we do. So, and I think I just, I just yeah, yeah. So, Neos Cosmos is a Greek community newspaper. We founded in 1957 out of the need to communicate uh, news accurately and information to Australia's booming Greek migrant population at the time. Uh, newly arrived Greek migrants had very, very real and urgent needs which were not or could not be fulfilled either by either government or other media. The first and most immediate obstacle migrants have was the boat of communication. Without, without the necessary English language skills, they, they required a trusted source of information. Uh, Neos Cosmos fulfilled that need with uh, accurate and as impartial as possible news and information on local and national issues. By extension, Neos Cosmos uh, often advocated for the rights of the migrant community as they were often not in a position to either access or understand their social or working rights. Neos Cosmos also fulfilled other, another need in the community and that was news, news from home. Uh, migrants had an insatiable appetite for news from Greece and Europe. They needed to know what was happening back home, from the place of their birth, where they had grown up, and where most of their families still resided. 
They needed to know politically and socially what was happening and where their homeland was headed. Many years have passed since those early days and communication has become easier, in fact, instant. Recently, you may recall, we had a minor earthquake here in Melbourne before we even had a chance to pick up a phone to talk to my editor. One of my got a phone call from Greece and they found out by a face call. That's a shame. Despite the now instantaneous nature of communication along the significant and significant demographic changes, uh, Nelspruz remains a trusted hub of our community. Whilst our core audience still remains our Greek language readers, most of whom arrive as migrants in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, our expansion into, into a dedicated English edition and bilingual website have shown remarkable growth over the past several years. It appears that targeted news both from the community but also um, <coughs> from Greece is still in demand. Uh, many of you here will be thinking how the current crisis um, in Greece would be of particular interest to our ears, and of course you'd be right. There has been a renewed interest in Greek and European affairs amongst our readers. We're now covering uh, much more Greek news, but also more European news, in order to allow our readers to come to a considered opinion about on what is happening, not only in Greece, but Europe itself. Over the past decade, such interest had actually waned significantly in, in, in our newspaper. Our readers were more focused on local and community affairs rather than what was going on in Greece. Accordingly, our editorial emphasis reflected that shift to the point where just a few years ago, Greek and European news was relegated to the back pages of our publications. This is not to say that our readers, or editorially, we did not have an opinion on Greece or Europe. In fact, both our newspaper and the board of Greek community have been an advocate of an integrated Europe. The vast majority of uh, saw Greece's position within Europe as being positive and one of progress, even if that meant more expensive holidays back to the homeland. Since Greece's slump, however, into recession and its teetering on bankruptcy over the past couple of years, there's been an open debate within the pages of our newspaper and, and uh, about not only politics and the, and the economy, but if it is still good for Greece to remain within the Eurozone. Whilst the majority of you uh, has still been on continued inclusion, there has been an increased feedback from many published libraries and opinions proposing that Greece revert to the drag map and leave the Eurozone to get them together. However, putting the ideological debate aside, many of our readers have real reasons to be connected, uh, concerned, and to voice their opinions. Many hold assets in Greece, whether that is property, shares, or cash in Greek banks. Some receive pensions or other income from Greece, uh, and many also have family, relatives, and friends to consider. It is also very popular for Greek Australians to hold dual citizenship. Many, especially younger people, use this opportunity to work and invest, not only in Greece, but throughout Europe. Uh, as you can see, our readers have an ongoing need to be informed about what is occurring in Greece and Europe, as it actually, uh, and it's actually affecting their lives directly. Likewise, there are also there's also been much debate about the radical shift in Greek politics in our newspaper and possibly even more debate on the stance of the power broker in Euro countries such as Germany and France. If our newspaper is any indicator of the broader European ideal, then it appears that Europe's crisis may actually be the conduit for meaningful engagement and possibly true union. That's just my personal opinion there. It's, uh, it's As a as a small community newspaper, we face countless challenges when writing about either Europe uh, or Greece or Europe. Obviously, the serious financial constraints, we're unable to make um, correspondence, as it's obvious, financial review kind of correspondence, it's unlikely that we be able to. Although, in, in some regards, it's a little bit easier because we do have, we can uh, to ask some journalists and trust, trusted people, which we do work with in Greece, but definitely not with it around Europe. So often, we, 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 we've got to rely upon what media is saying in Greece or, or internationally, and then use our own best judgment on presenting that news to our readers here. Having said that, the digital age has also opened up many opportunities. We are now able to connect and communicate with journalists, publishers, bloggers, etc., both within Greece and throughout Europe. The traditional barriers <coughs> no longer exist, but the desire for good journalism is more important than ever, especially as we seek, our newspaper that is, um, to communicate now in two languages and do it well, which is quite a challenge. In closing, I would uh, like to make a final observation on where we see foreign news reporting in the future. Uh, as earlier indicated, our, our newspaper had steered away from Greek and European news, as it was deemed less important. And despite the recent trend back due to the crisis, 
we have found ourselves covering a growing number of news items from our immediate region. This generally reflects upon the broader trend in, in the country. This is partly due to the fact that we republish many of the major national stories in, in the Greek language, but increasingly we have noticed an acceleration of people within our own community uh, who are somehow engaged with our regional neighbours. It's not uncommon for us to report on an Australian Greek business connection with China or an Australian Greek cultural story emanating from Bali. Our active community members and current leaders of our, uh, re readers, sorry, of our publications are no different to those people in the general community. Whilst they may have a cultural advantage by their heritage in Europe, they usually seize upon opportunities in the Asia Pacific region which they find more appealing. Thank you very much. You've done well, panel. You've kept the time, so that means we have time to discuss. So I'll throw it open for questions now. Please, take the chance. I guess one of the sorts of things that, in terms of the presentation that you made, is, you know, it could be seen as a very solid criticism of journalism in Australia and the, uh, the depth of its coverage, the complexity which it seeks to deal with. And I do think that um, we deserve better in terms of, you know, improved, more analytical publications like an economist or something like that. Television programs like PBS NewsHour in the UK, or in the US, where basically, you know, if you see KISS over there, I describe it as um, keep it stupid by false simplicity, is how I'd redefine KISS written up there. And I think that's the, a key to the Australian media. Mm. I, I think to be fair though, and that's important though, I mean, this is, you can say, it's a really interesting study, you can say lots with content analysis though, but there, there is a diversity, of course, I mean, there is certainly analysis in the film review, there's certainly analysis in been part of the ABC and so on, but we might take that question and go to Matt, I think, and see what you what your thoughts are on this. Oh, I'm glad there from anyone who works in the Australian media to defend it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the economists often always get put up as an example um, of a benchmark, and I think it's important to bear in mind that there is only one economist magazine in the world. It's a magazine which has an international audience of people who are willing to be challenged about their preconceptions, challenged about their biases, who are willing to learn something every time they pick up the, the newspaper, the magazine. And that's a very small number of people, and I do wonder whether um, there is, I doubt, in fact, there is an, an audience in, within Australia of the size who are willing to actually spend money on media which challenges them in that way. You have one recent addition is, of course, a global map. Um, online, which is philanthropically funded, which has got a huge um, level of analysis, I think. But you know, that's one source to seek out. Anyone want to comment on that one, or should we move on? Yes, I could say that we found out more about Australian media than we found out about Europe. So we didn't be expecting to find about anything. Uh, sorry, <laughs> from the media. You go for a book. <laughs> so mean tonight. We go to the library to find out things. Not you don't buy a newspaper, but. But really, in, in, in the world that, for example, Mark, the one who didn't come today, if he manages three newspapers and he explained to us that they use the same sources, the same stories for those three newspapers, and the journalist has to run a story or write a story for the three of them, so it could be one and the same story or it could be many different stories in one and the same day because he's employed by three newspapers that have merged and they are using him, that one single journalist, to produce stuff for the three of them. That's impossible. And then you have online media. That you, that they, they said that the problems that the journalism media industry are undergoing is just enormous. Well, you know the term is, is now journalism. Journalism. Or journalism coming out of um, Nick Davis's book. How many stories, what, what was your average um, number of stories per week from Paris? I would do a story a day that I worked. Yeah. Um, and of course, the challenge with Europe is particularly difficult is because there is no real um, uh, very, very rarely is there a story about Europe per se in terms of Europe that comes out of Brussels or very rarely is a European directive about the width of tra tractor wheels or something that comes in. I mean, Brussels, did that make a story? Um, uh, I would have been jumping between different countries all the time, um, uh, hovering around uh, Greece and Spain a lot. 
but to do really comprehensive, um, uh, I don't think I struggled from the problem of journalism in that sense, but just the, the breadth of stories in Europe and the, the, uh, the complexity of jumping from one country to another, it's not conducive to having a, a one correspondent. One correspondent cannot do that. To, to do it properly, like the Financial Times does it, like the Economist does it, um, like I imagine the New York Times do it, you need people who are across um, different countries. You need someone who can speak German and who can um, you know, parlay with bureaucrats and aides to Angela Merkel so that he can check up and call up the woman who's working for the same publication in Paris and run by what the Elysee Palace is saying. And so when you're doing it from the distance of Australia, you're never going to get more than one European, one correspondent for an Australian media outlet working there. I mean, for the ABC you might have two, but again, they're always based in London. You're just not going to get the sort of real analysis that that, that, that you probably deserve as a, as a, as a thinking audience um, from one publication who's only got the resources to put one human being there. Because you're, you need more than one person to cover it. It's not like the United States, where there's one economy, one country, one government, one overwhelming, well, one, not one narrative, but it's just easier to charge your way through as one journalist. We, we must take into account, of course, that while you did your study, it's when uh, certainly Australian media and other media around the globe are going, going through upheaval in terms of, you know, its business model and where it's sitting, and it's in absolute pain. I mean, it was a problem before as well, but it's a greater problem now, I think, and I think that partly explains it. It doesn't excuse it, but it explains it. More questions, please. Yeah, yeah when, uh, just to, to the study, when you were going to different people from the EU asking for their brand message, or like what message they want to convey to people, did you actually get the same answers, or did you actually get answers that were actually uh, contradicting itself? Well, we, we did, did both. We went through the documents that the EU has produced. They have a constitution that <laughs> failed, <laughs> but it actually says what it is that they are doing, what they are about, who they are, what they want to promote. There are paragraphs on this, so you can read that. And then people who work for the EU, they are trained. They have to say such things because yeah. this is mm -hmm. their work. In every action that they implement, there is something about democracy. If they, go, mm -hmm. they are trained, so this is not a political task. So. Yeah. Oh, so I thought you probably asked them more for their actual opinion about what the EU is like. Oh, some of them were just technical people telling us how this Europe by satellite works or how the footage okay. is done and so on. So it's not yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. I just find the concept of a brand really interesting coming from marketing. I always look at the EU and think it's so fair that there would be a company. No one would buy the product. This has been a constant nightmare for them. Because there is no product. Yeah. There is what? No. I said there isn't a product. Yeah, I it's think it, been, the product is the idea, it's a virtual but you wouldn't. Product. You don't buy the product. You can't product. go and buy the EU. You go you to France go to or the Germany EU, right? yes. or Poland. So that's why we were trying to figure out what exactly is Europe? Is it? Is it what? It's a huge internal conflict in the two concepts. But then again, they say diversity drives competition. And <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Yeah. Um, I'm actually uh, doing my PhD on cosmopolitanism, and uh, the European Union is basically shaped under Kantian philosophy of uh, universal caring for others. And so the European Union is something like a kind of equality system for all the European nations to share and to kind of subjugate a bit of their sovereignty. So they can be together, and the helping of the Greek uh, nation state as part of uh, helping others. Uh, so, to what extent is that strongly entrenched in European thinking? In, in, between, in terms of France and Germany, what I mean, are they really uh, on cosmopolitanism, or is it just like what uh, the gentleman was saying, just like a visual, a virtual thing, which is very amorphous? We might put it to you first and then we'll move across. The I don't know, I've been in Australia for eight years now. I don't have a fresh Yeah, <laughs> But when you, when you went there and when you spoke about the yeah. road... Yeah, but one thing I must say is that today's news, I think, of this, what the CNN and the left themselves in the round during the day, uh, uh, Hollande has lost a lot of popularity. Uh -huh. So whatever social stuff that he was advocating is definitely not working. He's got, got back to the business as usual. So. And I think in this argument of saving Greece or something, there's a lot of self-interest as well, because what has happened in Europe, they have started investing, moving businesses to where it's cheaper to produce something. If you go, we have a campus in Prato, for example, in Italy, our university. If you go there, you will see about 50 banks on your way from the hotel to the, 
to the campus, none of them is Italian. They're all from somewhere. So if this is the case in Greece, I haven't been so I don't know, yeah. it's probably about saving those banks and those businesses that should Absolutely. have established exactly themselves. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So you cannot, uh, well, you can also be good and you can be advocating that you're helping. <laughs> So we might move across because the, you mentioned the EU getting the, the peace price, and one of the one of the justifications was that they got it for the peace project. That you know, that the, whatever EU has done and whatever it's failed in, it has kept peace in Europe. That that was the justification for it. So I might go to you, Christopher. Then you you mentioned in your talk there that your reflection was that perhaps this crisis will actually lead to. I heard you saying, did you mean a more politically integrated union or something? better at the other end, is that what you were saying? No, I'm sort of... The caring you. <laughs> I think it's what Europe is for, I mean, that's what the directors are about. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the, the reality is, it, it can really only, I mean, it can really only come together if, if, if there is a political union. And you know, I think I think it was actually mentioned for the first time like, in May this year, earlier this year, again, with the next, uh, uh, the next uh, tranche of the, of the Greek uh, debt, that it came up again, uh, because of um, Spain was that, and, and it was actually mentioned for the first time in many years. So Europe itself understands that it's not working, and it, unless you <coughs> start talking about political union, then it's really not going to work. Mm. And I think that uh, this is what keeps on, it's the elephant in the room, in the corner there, it's just like, it's, it's you can't, there, we are, there are nation states, there are individuals, everyone's got their prime minister, they do, they do their own laws, I mean, yes, the vote right in between laws, and yes, I can travel and work between countries, and I can use, you know, go and use labor, cheat the labor down in Greece or wherever. Um, but unless there's uh, Europe as such, is this an idea? I mean, it's a, it's a great idea, but I mean, it's very, very difficult to implement. And uh, unless there's a real willingness from all the major, major countries, I think that's, it's going to really struggle. I think. Before we go to another question, Matt, what do you see? during your time there and the relationship between France and Germany and what's on the other side of the crisis then? Well, I'll just concur what you just said in terms of Europe is definitely moving towards a different model. The, Europe, the Eurozone is moving towards a different model. It's going to have more political and fiscal um, coordination and that has implications for how the media um, cover it. It may be that in future generations it's going to take a while for this stitching together of their economies to happen. But future generations will find it easier to conceive of Europe because Europe will be more like one economy, one polity. Um, the, um, the, the financial crisis has, 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 has um, shown stark relief, the cleavages between different countries with different economies growing at different paces, with different political systems and different political cultures. And um, Europe is definitely on a track, for Europe, the Eurozone at least, to bring that all together which means it's possible that they'll be different, um, it'll be easier to uh, conceive of Europe in the future. We will see if we get that report. We'll, yeah, we'll yeah. just yeah, say that, I mean, uh, whilst I think it's a very difficult group to on, they want to do this now. I mean, I lived in, in Greece for 10, ten years old, and, and I was there when, when uh, the Schengen uh, yeah, came to it. It's actually a pretty radical thing that happened in mm -hmm. Europe at the time. Um, and just that, things can happen. I mean, if they want to have it, they can have it, and people do accept it. Of course, those things are a bit a lot easier than, than, than you know, replacing having someone else go over you, whether they're based in Brussels or somewhere else. So the, the next phase is about my point, and that's why it hasn't really been tackled mm -hmm. up until now. Mm -hmm. Did you want to have a question? Uh, I thought that's, I was that's, that's a command. Uh, yeah. I'm less optimistic than, than you are regarding the, the future of Europe, because there's nothing you could call uh, a European-wide public sphere. Mm -hmm. If you look at the election campaigns, for instance, they are run by the national parties on, well, national topics in, in Germany, in France, and whatsoever. So I think the level of integration you have the institutions, but you have this lack of democracy and you have this lack of uh, well, public debate. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's not... not um, changing any time soon. Mm. From a political science perspective, it's certainly fascinating as to how they're going to do it if they can do it. You'll remember that there was a brief period in, well, maybe it wasn't picked up here as much, but in the French presidential election, 
when um, Angela Merkel from Germany said that she was going to campaign for Nicolas Sarkozy, and you had the beginnings, people were commenting on a pan-European polity of, um, of uh, the Christian Democrat Party starting to come together, and the Socialist Democrat Party sort of coming together in their way. Of course, Hollande, um, when he was campaigning, met with the leader of the Social Democrats in Germany. And um, it didn't work, and Angela Merkel didn't poll very well with French voters. This idea of having Frau Merkel come out and sort of say why they should vote for Nicolas Sarkozy, and <coughs> the Lycée Palace called up and said, you know what, bad idea, don't come. Um, so you had the beginning of it, but it actually didn't happen. So. More questions? Just, I think, the, um, I mean, I make it referred to there, really, basically, and, you know, the the general feeling in terms of, you know, the, um, oh, you know, why isn't it fixed by now, you know, why didn't it fix it last year? And I, basically I had that same sort of, um, same sort of feeling myself, but then going over there and talking towards lots of the people concerned, basically they saw the context, you know, where there were 27 different sheep that they had to herd in a particular direction, and it was a particularly com complex task and it would take years and years and years and years to sort out and I think that that's what you're talking about with the situation there'll be little crises here and there but basically the the complexity of the problem and the effort required politically to solve it is going to take many years regardless people are talking 15 to 20 you know just whatever happens yeah. So, are you going to do this? It's, are you going to do this study again in a, in a while and see? Hopefully, it's not going to be us because it's an amazing amount of hours we spend reading newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> but but it would be interesting to see if we still have a change. Yes, it's not going to do it in another five years. Yes, yeah, it's not been able to read for those three. Yeah. yeah. It's been, um, but it's very valuable that so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Do you think with um, more the media people, because the media is changing into more the internet based, more Facebook, more social media messages are like I know what's going on in Germany within five minutes when I log on at night time because all my friends are blogging me. Mm. So does that going to help the integration with Europe or does it, is it actually going to challenge it because it's a lot, it's not individual based, it's not very investigative news that travel fast, it's more the opinion based news that travel fast. It's, that's just, it's just an open question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's put it to uh, Christopher and Matt to start with. Well, I would say, on one hand, it's a negative, the internet, because it means it's easier for newspaper companies to close bureaus, because they can say that we can just take stuff off the web from um, European newspapers, so you don't have the benefit of having um, a person there, which is important if you're trying to construct a, a narrative so that people can understand what's going on, what matters, rather than just randomly taking bits and pieces that just seem to be the most sensationalist, exciting things from four different newspapers. So in that sense, it's... Um, it's a negative, but clearly it's a positive in the sense of people who are minded to um, actually try and get to the bottom of things and yeah. understand what's really going on can just um, circumvent the mainstream media themselves or the Australian media and find out for themselves through the horses now. I don't know, I think it's a very interesting period in the media where, where I think people in general, not the media, people are actually trying to work out for themselves uh, how much information do they actually really want? Do they want it just with social media? Do they want to just, or do they actually want to dig deeper? I mean, and and how much do they want that? Because it all comes back to the, the, the business model of media. I mean, essentially, some media works on you know, paying for it and, and advertising. So it's we're in. I think we're in that intermediate phase now, where it will it'll show how much interest people, intellectual interest, they really have in finding more out about. Because I mean, that's what journalists are trying to do. I mean, that's a good example. You know, it is, you know, in, in Paris and giving us a perspective from there. And do we want that? And can I just add to that that we were spoke, speaking to Matt before and before we came on the panel, and there's actually a parallel case going with, with copyright laws and how they're policed and where the media is going. Whereby for years we've seen the problems of you know copyright being policed. It's hardly possible anymore. Unofficially, the big rights holders, the big Sony's and EMI's of the world, have given up litigation because. 
they can't, you know, they can get a bit of money, but they can't, it's not, it's not effective use of, of, um, of their time anymore. We're seeing, we're seeing this, the, the start of that with journalism. Lots of um, researchers are now saying that, I don't know if you followed The Guardians and their um, experiment with open journalism, where they're really sourcing, they're doing the news, they do, they're actually crowdsourcing the news. And then they're using, they, they are diverting their professional journalists to do the analysis of it. They do the fact checking, the verification, and then do the follow up um, analysis. Whether that is the way it's going to be, we don't know because we're just at the beginning of it. But you know, it's certainly happening. News has never been rocket science. News has been pretty straightforward. Analysis, ch fact checking, verification—that's the rocket science. Did you want to comment on this or the rocket science? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I could ask both journalists if you were to advise against using open would they advise them to start a journalist? I don't know. Let's hear it. Um, yes. Oh, look, I think that uh, I think that journalism is still going to, still going to be a uh, desire and need for good journalists. But, um, yeah. I, but, but I, I, I don't. Really to come to the job with what skills, what knowledge do you have to have today to survive in the field, in the, in the field? I don't think that, I don't think the skills have changed. I think uh, a good journalist is a good journalist, one who you know really understands. Uh, uh, well, yes, it's, it's, it's education and. A, really announce for what, what uh, looking in between the lines and seeing where what the story is and also knowing how to present how to write a story and engage engage someone and give a perspective which you won't get. I mean, you know, there's a lot of also journalism that is very boring. You can read it, and you can read the story, and it's, you can really learn anything but some facts. And, and, but you know, I think everyone wants to be when you read with journalism, you really get engaged. And you, it, it, it's giving you a perspective which. Um, you know, and, and yes, it's got all that professionalism behind it, but it's giving you uh, a human perspective, um, which, which we can relate to. Do you want to comment on that? Oh, I would just say that there'd definitely be a trend amongst um, media companies for a while to look for people who don't necessarily have journalism degrees, but have a degree in law, economics, science, um, political science, something else that they can take, history. And um, if you were to be, what we were talking about before, to be a really good European correspondent, you'd someone who'd have a very good uh, history, a mosaic history of Europe. And that's what we've seen, to add to that question, yeah. that, that's what we've seen in journalism education, we've seen the double degrees. There's hardly any undergrads anymore that do just a journalism degree. You sort of you do a double major, you think carefully about what you do. But the, I must say, though, I, we have, after the Fairfax announcement of the 1900 jobs and, and more, we thought we would see the... Um, we thought we would see our enrollment numbers, but they haven't. I don't know why. I mean, last last um, open day at Monash Uni, there were parents and you know young prospective students queuing up, and the parents were saying, "Don't do it," and the kids were saying, "We want to, we want to." You know, I don't know. We make a blog. Always done with Greece. Always done with Greece. I've been free myself, so yeah, absolutely. Last question, or should we call it there? Let's thank the panel then. Thank you very much.